Good evening. Hello and uh, welcome. And thank you for coming along tonight for what we hope will be an auspicious occasion. It's our launch lecture for a series of public lectures put on by the ARC Centre of Excellence in Exton Science to look at the challenges of moving across to a sustainable energy future. <laughs> Um, we've called this series of, conversation, of uh, talks Light Conversations, and um, for those of you who are concerned, the person who came up with that pun has been fired, so don't, <laughs> don't worry too much. Um, what we hope to do across this series of lectures is tell you a little bit about the challenge of moving across to a renewable um, energy economy, and this is one of the greatest challenges that, that we face on the planet at the moment. Um, most of us, have, I think, over the summer in Australia will have really worried about the climate, and the impact of burning fossil fuels. But in a way, there's a much bigger challenge than climate change. And that's what we're going to do when the fossil fuels actually run out. And that's something that most of us don't like to think about. But according to BP, fossil fuels, the oil in particular, is going to start to run out in 40 years, which is not a very long time away. So somehow, between now and the next 40 years, we've got to figure out what's the next form of energy that we can use to power our planet. And we'd like that form of energy to be renewable. So the best form of energy is going to be solar because it's, there's far more of that form of energy than anything else, far more than wind or hydro. Um, but we still don't really understand very much about the way light interacts with matter. So across these series of lectures, we're going to try and tell you a little bit about what our centre does and how we hope to contribute. Now, our centre is uh, derived from the name of exotons, which you're going to learn about in these lectures. But we work across three ideas. One is how can we understand through light interactions how we can improve solar energy conversion, um, how can we make more efficient lighting and displays. So right now, around 20% of all of our electricity is spent on lighting. So improving lighting efficiency can drastically reduce our energy consumption. And along the way, our um, understanding of these materials and light interactions is also being used to help Australian industry. <coughs> Before I get into the talk any further, I should go in order of my notes here, and that's to point out that um, if you're nervous about photography and video, we are taking uh, films tonight. Um, if you are concerned about appearing on Channel 10 News tomorrow, please talk to our staff to make sure you're deleted from our, our videos. <coughs> um, we're also taking this opportunity to present this at the State Library of, of Victoria, and uh, it's a prestigious place, but we weren't the first ones here. So let me start by also acknowledging uh, the Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting tonight. I'd also like to pay respects to the uh, elders past and present of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to extend our respects to any other Indigenous Australians who are present tonight. So this um, conversation is going to be put together by the Centre of Excellence in Exxon Science, which brings together five Australian universities, University of Melbourne, Monash, UNSW, Sydney, and RMIT. And we have two speakers tonight who are going to talk to us about this basic problem of how light interacts with matter. The first of those speakers is, uh, Dr. is Professor Jared Cole, who's from over the road here at RMIT. He's a professor of theoretical physics. And our second speaker is Professor Dane McAmey from the University of New South Wales, who's an experimental physicist. And what they're going to try and do is tell us a little bit about what actually happens when light is absorbed by matter, and hopefully let you see some of the challenges that are involved in transitioning and discovering the new materials that we need to reach a sustainable energy future. So with that, let me ask our first speaker to come up. Professor Jared Cole, can you please make him feel welcome? So, are we ready for some Thursday night science? Um, as Paul said, I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm very excited about quantum mechanics. However, I've learnt the hard way that starting a lecture with quantum mechanics is not a good idea. Yeah? It works okay with my second years and my fourth years. First years, not so well. Public, definitely not. So we're going to step through a few different ideas, and I'll give you a flavour for them and how they work together. And then we're going to kind of finish at the point where Dane's going to be able to then talk about how this feeds into how solar cells work and how we can improve them. So I'm going to start with a very simple concept. Light comes in different colours. No great surprise. And because it's, everyone's dark, I don't want anyone falling asleep, and it's early on in the lecture, we're going to do some audience participation. I want you, on the count of three, to tell me the colour of the sphere I'm about to show you. One, two, three. Red. One, two, three. Yellow. 
even louder. One, two, three. Orange. Good. Now, how do you know this? Have you ever thought about that? How do you know that they're different colours? Because the light coming from the screen to your eyes has information. Now, it turns out that this is a concept and a... Um, a description that we've had for a very long time, hundreds of years. And we can very well describe the fact that we see these different colours using the wave theory of light. The idea that light is carried by waves, it turns out they're electromagnetic waves, though we didn't know that 400 years ago. So we really can think of waves on water. Yeah? But as soon as you introduce the concept of waves, you also introduce the concept of wavelength. The distance between the crests and the troughs of the wave. Yeah. So wavelength is going to come up again and again. So that's the first concept we've got. So wavelength and the concept of waves is really good at explaining this picture. So this is a picture or a, or a cartoon of a glass prism, and we're shining white light into it, and out comes a rainbow. This is exactly the same principle behind actual rainbows in the sky. White light comes into raindrops, and then it comes out as rainbows. Why? Well. Light, white light is made up of light of many different wavelengths, and when they get pass through the glass in a prism or the water in a water droplet, they travel different paths and they spread out. So this rainbow is literally a list of all the different wavelengths of light in the original incoming light. In fact, we can measure very precisely those wavelengths. This extreme end is about 380 nanometers, that extreme end is 740 nanometers nanometer, a billionth of a metre. So these wavelengths are about 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. OK? Now, why does it stop? It stops because we've got biological eyes. Our eyes are only sensitive to a certain point in both directions. Actually, the electromagnetic spectrum goes all the way from radio waves, AM radio waves and, and radar, all the way through to gamma rays at the other end. But our eyes are only sensitive to this band. 380 nanometers to 4, 740 nanometers. So the wave picture for understanding why things have color is very simple. We have each of our spheres. White light comes in. Most of the wavelengths are absorbed by the sphere, and only predominantly the yellowy, about 600 nanometers, that light is reflected off, or orange or red. So we can measure what comes off and from that, we can kind of make a plot of how the distribution of colours looks like as a function of wavelength. That's this plot here. Of course, I'm a theorist, so I just made it up. But you can actually measure it. Actually, the backstory here is I borrowed a spectrometer from the lab and actually did measure it, but the data was so noisy that I just went with a pretty theory picture. <laughs> um, but I'll show you the thing that I actually measured in a minute. So, here, this plot tells us that if a, it's a yellow object, and it's a very pure yellow object, then the light is predominantly between 550 and 600 nanometers. If it's orange, it's about 600. If it's red, it's further 750, uh, 650 to 700. But there's some spread. And that's kind of, this is all the wave picture of light. It gives you this idea of the amount of energy as a function of wavelength. However, that's not the whole story. That was the story for a few hundred years. And this is how we can kind of understand the rainbow. Yeah, you can see that the rainbow is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, roigabiv. Interestingly, um, blue and violet are kind of the same colour. Yeah, and where's purple? The boundaries are arbitrary. In fact, there are seven colours because Isaac Newton was superstitious. Yeah, <laughs> Isaac Newton was superstitious. He liked seven. That's why there's seven. Anyway, arbitrary, the point is that it's a continuum. So let's ask the question, what happens if we turn the intensity of the light down? So we make it dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. We can then ask, what is the smallest amount of light that is reflected off? It turns out this is a finite amount. In fact, there is single particles of light, quanta of light, they're called photons. This is where quantum mechanics comes from, quanta, packets. So there are packets of light in these photons. And it, we can calculate the energy of these photons. There's going to be two equations in this talk. Both are for effect. 
This one's relatively important for understanding, the other one's purely effect. <laughs> so the energy of the photon is HC divided by lambda. H and C don't matter, it's just so the numbers work properly, it's all about units. H is Planck's constant, C is the speed of light, but that doesn't matter. What matters is energy is one on lambda, or is proportional to one on lambda. The longer the wavelength, the sh less energy. Shorter wavelength means higher energy. So purple photons have more energy than red photons. So this continuum of wavelengths also means a continuum of energies. But each photon is discrete. There's a finite amount of energy per photon, and it's given by that. Notice that it doesn't depend on how bright it is. So the energy per photon only depends on the wavelength. The number of photons tells you the intensity. The brighter it is, the more photons there are. But each photon has the energy given by its wavelength. Okay? This is a relatively modern interpretation of how light works, and it turned out it was one of the precursors to our understanding of quantum mechanics. So we have to think a little bit about, I drew these Gaussians, these, these distributions of colour. So what's actually happening is the white light is coming in, which is a mixture of many photons of many different wavelengths, many different colours, but only certain wavelengths are reflected by the sphere. And you can see I've kind of done Lots of orange, but one yellow, one red. This has got some width, so there's mostly orange and a bit of red and a bit of yellow. If I had a laser pointer, it's a re ironically, this is not a real laser pointer, it's a, a fancy, I can do this with it, <laughs> but I can't laser point with it. Um, it means that the laser is, you know how laser is a really clear, bright colour? That's because this peak is really narrow. A laser is pretty much just one wavelength, or very close to. We call it very narrow spectral response. So this idea that all light can be expressed as a peak, and that peak is somehow uh, exists on this line of wavelength, this is actually the concept of spectroscopy. It's one of the most fundamental experiments that we do in physics and chemistry. It's been around for hundreds of years in various guises, and we learn an enormous amount about how the physics of the, or the, how the universe works by doing spectroscopy. And I'll show you a few examples of that soon. And you're going to need to know about spectroscopy when we see Dane's more recent stuff. Now, things can emit light. Everything I've said so far is about light reflecting. Yeah? But where did the light come from? I haven't explained where the light came from. I just said it was there, it was shining. And then it, had, it was reflected. So it had to come from somewhere. Turns out everything emits light. So, what is this? Orange. What colour is it? Orange. No, 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 what colour is it? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah? In fact, orange and orange are the same word in English because when oranges came to Great Britain, the word orange didn't exist in the English language, and so then we said, oh, it's orange. So, hilariously, oranges are orange because they're orange. Yeah, think about it. Now, so we know, how, we know why this looks like this. Yeah? You can see the light kind of reflecting here. You can see that it's predominantly orange. It's absorbing a lot of blue and green light and purple light and reflecting mostly yellow, orange and red light. I'm a theoretical physicist, as you may have heard. The only philosophy I've ever learned in my life is from fortune cookies. Okay? I'm not really that into philosophy. However, tonight I'll make an exception. Here's a philosophical question for you. What colour is an orange when I turn out the light? Ah, very good. Giving the punch light away. Fantastic. Physics has an answer for this riddle. Here is the spectrum of a 27 degree C orange. In fact, this is the spectrum of a 27 degree chair, a 27 degree person, although you have to cool them down and then they'd be in hypothermia, but anyway. Any object is emitting light with this spectral signature if it's at 27 degrees. Okay? We don't see it because there's so much light reflecting. This is not the reflected light, this is the emitted light. This originates from the object. 
So if you put an orange in a black box and you seal it up completely light tight, and then you ask if you had a magic detector inside the box, what would it see? It would see this. Turns out to be an incredibly difficult experiment to do because you've got to cool it and you've got to buy expensive equipment and that costs money and taxpayers don't understand why you want to see what an orange looks like. There's an easier way. Can anyone think of something that has no possible light coming from outside? No way light can reflect off it. Ooh, close. So that absorbs light and at the boundary where the matter is spiraling into the black hole, it can still emit light. In fact, it's the universe. Oh, I should say, of course, we can't see the orange because the visible spectrum is here at very short wavelengths. This peak is at 10,000 nanometers. Our eyes stop working at 740 nanometers. Okay? Now, the universe turns out to be an exceptionally good experiment for doing this question of, of asking this question, what happens when there's no possible light coming from outside? Because what do you know? We know of no light sources outside the universe. Yeah? So this spectrum is the spectrum of the universe. You see, it's got the same shape. The peak is different. This is measured in ridiculous units because spectroscopist, long story. But it's got the same shape. From this peak, we can tell that the universe is at 3 degrees, or 3 Kelvin, which is minus 270 degrees C. Okay? But we can see that it fits very well. That idea that an object, when there's no light reflecting off it, has a spectral response like this just from its temperature, it's called um, the black body effect, or it's black body radiation. And the universe turns out to be an incredibly good black body radiator. And that's what this is. And from where the peak sits, you can tell what the temperature is. But we can use this same technique to measure the temperature of other things. We can measure the temperature of the stars. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Blue, red, orange, lots and lots of different colours. It turns out, by fitting that peak, you can convert colour into temperature. And this is how we know um, stars on the other side of the galaxy, we can still measure their temperature by looking at this kind of spectrum and fitting it. And people have done this. And so this is why we know an enormous amount about how stars grow, how they're born, how they die. We know a lot about our sun by looking at the temperature of the light coming from the stars. And our sun, of course, is a star, so it's no exception. Here is the black body spectrum. You can kind of see it has the same shape. The shaded region is the theoretical fit, and the squiggly bit is the actual experimental data. This is measured in space, by the way, not on the Earth. The, you'll see a spectra in Dane's half of the talk where he shows the Earth one, which has changed because of the atmosphere, but this is actually measured in space. And from this, we can tell that the average temperature of the sun, or at least the surface of the sun, is 5,777 Kelvin. It's rather hot. And we can... So the fact that the sun's spectral response, the fact that the light and how the light depends on wavelength that comes from the sun can be pretty well described by black body radiation. Black body radiation itself can be explained by the idea that not only do photons come in quantum packets, but all energy comes in quantum packets. Yeah? There's quantized energy. It's a fundamental principle behind modern physics, and it's a fundamental principle behind quantum mechanics. And this, and the picture of the universe, and all these other measurements of blackbody radiators are direct evidence for that. So, we've learned a few things. We'd like to learn one more thing. Things can absorb light. Now, I've talked about they can reflect light. I've talked about they can emit light. Now I want to talk about them absorbing light. So, everything is made of atoms. Yeah? I hope that's a non-controversial statement. This is what atoms look like. No! This is how people with no science education draw atoms. This is how the people on Big Bang Theory draw atoms. <laughs> this is not what atoms look like. When you look at a textbook, it might start here and talk about the planetary model. This idea that there is a nucleus, protons and neutrons in the centre, and it's orbited by electrons. This was a fairly popular model at the start of quantum mechanics. It doesn't hold water. This is a slightly better version of that, 
Actually, the electrons are never in perfect orbits, but they're smeared out in space. There's a probability distribution. So there's a cloud of electrons around the nucleus. This is kind of the modern interpretation. Also wrong. OK, all of these pictures are wrong. This is not what atoms look like. Do you want to see what atoms look like? Yeah? yeah? Do you want to see the secret that only the physicists know? What atoms actually look like? We don't tell anyone, because it might warp their little minds. Ready? Ready? Oh, it's, just, <laughs> it's just beautiful, isn't it? It is glorious. It's just the poetry. This wonderful darling of mine is called the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the helium atom. This tells us everything we need to know about the helium atom. Now, I acknowledge it's not the most useful form, okay? But it's very precise. When we talk to chemists like our director, we have to calculate some things so that they can compare them. These, they like these pictures. So particularly, these horizontal lines, they are the energy levels. That is the solution to that equation. You solve the equation either with some pretty hairy hand maths or a fancy computer. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure these days I could do it on my iPhone, but um, you get these energy levels out. And these tell you everything you need to know. They actually turn out to be very equivalent pictures, the first picture I showed you and the energy levels. And people like Paul very much like that. Honestly, three hours ago, I got an email from Paul saying, mm, perhaps not put the Schroeder equation in? Over my dead body! <laughs> now, these energy levels, <laughs> these tell you all about the atom. Already you can tell something. Notice they're all discrete. There's a finite number of them. So there are these finite quantized energy levels. There's another quantum. So again, the fact that there are finite energy levels is part of the quantum mechanical theory of how atoms work. Now, of course, sometimes we want to make pretty pictures, like in public talks or something like that. So you can do these kind of orbitals. I cheated a little bit. These ones are hydrogen, not helium. But nonetheless, they look pretty. So this is a representation of that probability distribution of the electrons. And one corresponds to each of the discrete levels, and there's many of them. Actually, an infinite number of them, but that's a long story. Um, what, but what I particularly want to talk about here is, if you have these finite energy levels, that means you can absorb and emit light by moving between these levels. You can absorb a finite amount of energy, you can emit a finite amount of energy. Over here, is the spectrum for helium. It's kind of rainbow colored. That's the black body radiation, sure. But notice the sharp lines. There's a yellow one, there's a faint green one, there's a few more blue ones, some purple ones, there's some red ones down here. They all correspond to moving between the levels. So photons that move between the levels have a fixed energy and therefore correspond to a fixed line because there's a fixed wavelength. It turns out this tells us an enormous amount about the helium atom by looking at these kind of spectra. I'll come back to this in a second. So, how does that work? Well, here are some levels. We're sitting in the ground state, the lowest energy state. A photon comes in. Its energy matches exactly the distance from here to here. So, the atom can absorb that energy the photon has disappeared, but the atom is now in an excited state. It's in the next level up in the ladder. We could absorb another photon and go up again. Notice the space in between the levels is not equal, so the colors are not the same, yeah? Because the wavelengths have to match. But once it's up there, it doesn't like being in an excited state. There's a whole thing about thermodynamics. It just doesn't like being up there. Balls roll downhill, yeah? This is not surprising. So eventually it comes back down again. It could go the way it came, but it's actually more likely to come straight down and give out an even higher energy photon. It can happen the other way around, around as well. Go straight up with a high energy photon and then come down many steps. This means, for instance, if we were to look at the light coming out, we would not see this photon or that photon, but we would see the blue photon because it's gone. 
So we would see a dark line here and here and a bright line there. Or vice versa, depending on how you do the experiment. This is the sun. This is the light from the sun after it's been put through a prism and separated into all its wavelengths. It's very pretty. I quite like it. The black bands are where the magic is. Every one of these bands correspond to an absorption line from the elements in the sun. So very careful spectroscopists have gone through and allocated every one of these lines to something going on in the sun. This is how we know how much hydrogen is in the sun, how much helium is in the sun, how much carbon, how much nitrogen, what the sun is made up of, how it's changing over time. In fact, and this is the really cool part, this is how we found helium. We found helium in the sun before we found it on Earth because there were lines in this spectrum that people didn't understand and they realised it was another element and then they measured it on Earth. That's why it's called helium. Helios, yeah, the sun. So this spectrum tells us an enormous amount about what's going on in the sun. It also tells us we can repeat the same kind of experiments on Earth with many different elements. And this is there's a whole field of spectroscopy. It's used for diagnosis, for diagnostic applications. It's used for huge amounts of different things in chemistry and biology. It's a very common technique. And it's all about the fact that quantum mechanics says when energy is absorbed or emitted, it has to do so in some kind of finite steps because the total energy still has to be conserved. Okay? Now, one last concept before I hand over. Molecules are also things. Kind of makes sense? So we've seen how atoms behave. It's the same story with molecules. There are some other complications, but pretty much it works the same for molecules. So, here is a molecule called tetracine. This is one that I've learnt a lot about recently. I didn't know this molecule even existed before we started working in the centre because my chemistry education is very poor. Um, I was far more interested in maths and physics and computers. But nonetheless, this is tetracine. Those are carbon atoms, or of course it's not a true image, it's a, a, an a approximation or a visualisation of tetracine. The spheres are carbon, I've kind of hidden the hydrogens, Nonetheless, it's a molecule. It's in its ground state. I've done the little picture on the left the same as I did before. Now, I can send a photon in, and I can excite it up to the first excited state. Now, over here, I've drawn, again, these kind of orbital pictures to show you where the electron sits on the molecule. You notice it's not on one atom. It's spread across the whole molecule. That's going to become important later. So it's spread across that molecule, but there's some, you can see where the electron is on average. But when it went up, it left a gap behind. And that we call a hole. Because what else do you call holes? Uh, gaps that are left behind. Yeah? So we had an electron's gone up, a hole's gone down. This is the distribution of the holes. Both exist. So when you absorb the energy, you create this excitation, you separate an electron and a hole, and that combination is an exciton. Yeah? So now you know what an exciton is. You also know how to pronounce it. It's a hilarious talking to journalists about exitons because the variety of pronunciations is hilarious. Or pronunciations? <laughs> anyway. Light is made of photons. All matter emits and absorbs photons. The colour of photons depends on how much energy they have. Yeah? We've done all of those concepts. Quantum mechanics tells us why the sun emits photons and that it has some spread, many different wavelengths. Light is emitted, it's absorbed, and how it interacts with atoms and molecules is all well described by quantum mechanics. The theory can be complicated at times, but the answers it obtains are very accurate. So quantum mechanics is a really good description of how these things work. And finally, when a molecule absorbs some energy, or absorb, it absorbs a photon, it can form an exciton. Now, you've done all of the warm-up stuff, I'm going to hand over to Dane, who's going to show you how this is used in solar cells.
Uh, thanks, Jared. Um, so we've all seen a solar cell. Everyone's, everyone's driven around, around Melbourne and, and seen that a lot of roofs have solar cells. What I'm going to do now is try and take you from where Jared's left us, the idea that photons are, element, uh, are, are objects, they're discrete, they're quantized, they have a particular energy, and try to work through how we go about extracting that energy, what limitations there are on how we can extract that energy, and then are there tricks we can play with chemical systems or with quantum mechanics to try to overcome those limitations and make more efficient photovoltaic devices. So Jared left us with this picture. I have some object, it can absorb light, and that light can transition between one discrete level and another. Now, if I go back here, semi um, solar cells are made out of often silicon. Most solar cells you see on a roof around you will be made out of silicon. And silicon is uh, a crystal. It's made up of a whole lot of atoms that are periodically spaced and held together um, by, by some of the, the forces that are, that are of interest. Now, because there's a whole lot of atoms, some weird things happen. Instead of having discrete levels, these levels tend to smear out, and we get things called bands. This is the band structure picture of a semiconductor. And what is allowed to happen is I can have a, an electron can live down here, and this we call the, the valence band. Uh, and if light comes in, it can be excited up into the conduction band. And in fact, it can be excited up anywhere into this space up here. Light can't be excited into the gap. And that's a, just a, a critical um, thing to remember for the rest of the, the, this talk. So let's work through this. If I have red light come through, now red light doesn't have enough energy. Red light can't excite that electron from the valence band to the conduction band because there's no state there for it to go into. So red light doesn't get absorbed. Let's say I have this yellow light, this light that just meets the energy, energy gap. So that light can come in, that photon can come in, it can get absorbed and promote an electron from the bottom state to the top state. <coughs> if I have much higher energy photons, they can come in and excite electrons way up, up to the top of the, up into the conduction band. And what happens then is that those electrons that have that excess energy tend to rapidly rattle down to the edge, emit some heat. And so, this is effectively the entire picture you need to know to understand why solar cells are as efficient as they are and why we can't really make them much better given their current state. So what have we got? We've got low energy photons that don't get absorbed. We've got photons that have energies that match this gap that are absorbed and photons with energy higher than the gap which are absorbed up here, rattle down to the edge and lose some of their energy and heat. Now what I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is work through a little exercise to show you how this place is a limit on how well solar cells can extract energy from the sun. So let's say we have a spectrum that looks like this. Uh, we, we have some objects, maybe it's an orange, emitting energy that starts at zero energy and moves up to four energies. I'm gonna leave the units off here because it, it doesn't really matter what the units are. It's the concept more than anything else. Uh, and it's sort of fairly uniform across that, across that range. What we would like to do is extract all of that power. We'd like to turn that light, the energy in the light, into energy we can use effectively. Now, we're gonna do it by choosing some material, let's say silicon, and say that silicon has a gap that's one energy unit deep. So what does that mean? It means that we know that we need photons that have more than one energy unit to get absorbed. So what I'm gonna do now is work through this picture and find out how efficiently in each region can I absorb that energy. So, Zero efficiency means photons are not absorbed at all. 100% efficiency means they're absorbed and we get all their energy out. So underneath that gap, this is the red photon, the photon comes in, passes straight through the material, can't be absorbed and goes away. So we can't get any of the energy in that space. So zero efficiency. At the edge, this is our yellow photons, they can come in, they can get absorbed, we get all of the energy because they don't rattle down. So we don't lose any of the energy as heat. The challenge now is for the photons above that, these blue photons that rattle down. If we're just a little bit above the band gap, that's fine. We lose a little bit of energy as they rattle down to the edge, but that's, that's not a problem. What happens if our photons have twice the energy of that gap? Well, it means we're losing half the energy that's available to us from that photon every time we absorb it. 
So this is a, a photon of energy two in this picture. It will rattle down. We only get 50% of that energy. If it has an energy of three, we only get a third. If it has an energy of four, we only get a quarter. And that's what this, that's what this, um, this, this picture is here. So we can only really extract the energy underneath this curve. And it turns out, of the four energy units that are available to us, with this picture, we can only extract about 1.4 of those energy units. Now, so it's a, a cell with an efficiency of about 35%. It turns out this picture is actually a reasonable model for the silicon solar cell on your roof. They're limited in efficiency to, to somewhere around 30%. Um, that's challenging. If you're going to make a solar cell and put it on your roof, you'd really like to extract more than 30% of the solar energy that's, that's hitting it. Um, you can see that that would be a nice thing to have. Um, one of the big challenges I think we face in society in the adoption of these types of technologies, apart from sort of the lack of a policy framework, is that, um, is that there's a cost. If solar cells are cheaper, more people are going to put them on their roof. Uh, and one way to do that is not to make the cell cheaper. It turns out the majority of the costs for putting a solar system in is not the, the, the silicon, it's the installation costs. Um, one way to make it cheaper per unit of energy produced is to make them more efficient. So it's going to cost me some amount of money to install them. It doesn't really change depending on how efficient the cell is. So if I can make the cell more and more efficient, then I can make the total cost of energy you produce lower. So that's what we're going to try and do. We're going to try and come up with some tricky ways to improve silicon solar cells. And what I'll say is where I am right now in this talk is sort of the state of the art. There's not much more than where we're up to now that exist in the cells on your roof. And everything I want to talk about from now on is sort of the subject of ongoing research around the world. Um, this is a more realistic picture. What I've done here is taken Jared's um, spectrum of the sun and flipped it around. So now instead of having large wavelengths on the right, I have large energies. Uh, you can see now that there are some things happening. Um, these gaps here that didn't exist in Jared's picture are because as well as the sun having elements in them, the atmosphere has elements. And those elements can also absorb light from the sun. So instead of seeing this nice smooth spectrum, we see a spectrum that has gaps where, say, water is absorbing light or other elements in the atmosphere are absorbing light. And maybe at the end of this, we can have a little discussion about why having carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it absorbing light is not a good thing. We'll see how we go there. Um, the orange is the part of that spectrum that we can extract with a conventional silicon solar cell. They're about 25, 28% efficient. Um, and so this whole concept, this idea of a limiting efficiency is named after these two guys, um, Shockley and Quiser. Um, Shockley is uh, quite famous. He invented um, the transistor, which sort of changed modern electronics and allowed the, the, the technological world that we live in. Uh, but he was also involved in broadly across the semiconductor industry working, working out of the US in the 50s and 60s. Um, all right, so let's go to this picture. What would we like to do? Well, it looks like there's a whole lot of energy being left on the table in this region here. Um, quite a lot, as it turns out. And one way people have come up with to think about harvesting that energy is to say, what if instead of having one photon with energy two, we could take that photon and split it in half to have two photons with energy one? Then we're, we're much better at extracting energy from those photons. So we should be able to get all the energy out if we can do that process efficiently. So let's make something called a down converter. Let's try and make some material, some machine, some device that takes a high energy blue photon and spits out two low energy yellow photons or orange photons. Um, what that allows us to do is just to harvest things more efficiently. And so what would, that happen, what would happen to this picture? So if we could do that with perfect efficiency, we could change our, our extraction curve to look a little bit more like this. We would move from taking 1.38 of these power units to just over two of these power units and increase our efficiency from 35% to 50%. So this is where we come back to the ideas of the, the Jared mentions. Let's take this tetracine molecule. It turns out that this tetracine molecule is really interesting. It has two energy levels. Uh, one of them is at about two energy units, and the other is just over one energy unit. So what we would like to do is use this molecule or molecules like it to try to make a machine, a molecular machine or a molecular optical device that absorbs light of one high energy colour, splits it in two and sends light out at a different, different colour. 
So if we're going to have two of these excitations, we're going to need two of these molecules. It turns out if for the machine to work, it has to be linked together. We might want to make a molecule that looks a little bit like this. And we might send a photon in, and we'll excite one of these blue excitons on one side of that molecule. Given the way this molecule has been designed, sometime after that, that blue molecule with two energy units will split into two orange excitons with one energy unit. And then we can extract that out into our solar cell and, and use it to generate more energy. The challenge is this. That's a really lovely picture. Um, and if it only worked like that, we would all be going home and, and celebrating um, our, our highly efficient silicon solar cells that extracted all the energy from the sun. Quantum mechanics doesn't like us. Um, there's another quantum concept you might have heard of. It's a thing called spin. So all fundamental particles have a property called spin. And spin's conserved. We talked about how energy is conserved. You can't make or destroy energy in these processes we're doing. Spin is also conserved. You can't make or destroy spin. And it turns out that these excitons have spin. And there's only so many ways we can mix spin up and move spin around. So the, the first thing I excite has, has sort of two spin units. It has to split into something that has one split spin unit. And there's only a, number, a certain number of ways we can do that. So here they are. We can have like up, up. We can have up zero, we can have up, down, down, up. There's a whole range of different approaches for building those spin systems. And the rules of quantum mechanics limit how we can move from these single two energy unit blue, blue excitations into the two one energy unit orange excitations. Um, I thought of what I would show you is, is sort of the complexity of what we're dealing with here. Um, Jared and I are going to stand up on stage tonight and talk a lot about concepts. We'll do this, we'll do that, and these things will happen. A lot of what we do day to day is, is in our lab or in our office, cranking through that Schrodinger equation and trying to understand precisely what's going to happen to these spins. So here's, here's an example of that. This is, this is what happens uh, for a particular formation of that molecule as a function of time on the time scale of about 50 nanoseconds. And what you see is that um, everything starts in this red spin state over here. This is the, the two, the spin state of two. And these are all the other possible combinations of spins we can end up in. And if you run this simulation, you find out that you end up with quite a lot of your spins down in this state down here, some of them here. And it depends on the details of how that molecule is oriented with respect to electric fields, magnetic fields, other molecules that are around it, um, how those two individual tetracines are arranged with respect to each other. So there's a lot of detail that goes into how this thing can evolve. And um, what people spend a lot of time doing is trying to understand at this sort of level how these processes happen so that we can make them more efficient. So one of the things we've done is take that molecule and change how it's joined together. It turns out if you make it really rigid, then it doesn't go as well. It has to have some sort of floppiness to it to allow these sorts of processes to happen. So it's a really nice sort of problem where you have to understand the quantum mechanics at a really deep level. You have to be able to make new molecules and new molecular systems to allow you to engineer the optical properties of a system you're going to eventually want to put on someone's roof in a solar cell. So I think it sort of speaks to the, to the, the value of this really fundamental, somewhat esoteric science in generating new technologies. Um, all right, so we've, we've done that roughly 51.7%. That's called singlet fission, that process. Um, or exciton fission or multi-exciton generation. There's a whole lot of space left down here. So this is those photons that don't have enough energy to get absorbed. So they're the ones that go straight through the solar cell and we're never going to see them again. So what can we do there? Well, let's try and do the opposite. Let's try and add those together. Let's try and take two of those photons that have slightly more than half the energy of that, of that gap and add them together to make one photon that has, has twice energy and we can absorb with high efficiency. So we're going to call this an up converter. It's, um, I appreciate we're not really great at naming these things in a really exciting way. Um, how do they work? Well, two photons come in, half of the energy, they get added together, and another photon comes out on the other side. 
Um, if we can do that well, then we add another bit, of, bit to this curve. We start to extract more and more energy. We go from 50% up to 60%. So effectively what we've done by adding these two different materials to our cell is move from, a, from an efficiency of, of low 30s to 60. We've nearly doubled the amount of energy in this particular case that we can extract from our solar cell. Here's an example of that material. So this is a uh, material that a colleague of mine, Tim Schmidt, made uh, in, in a lab in Sydney. Uh, and what you can see there is a red laser coming in. And in the material, it gets absorbed and then re-emits blue light. Um, which may initially not seem crazy to you, but when you realise that blue light has more energy than red light, then it really is a, an interesting idea that we've sort of started adding photons together to change the energy properties. Um, and depending on the materials you use, there are a whole bunch of things you can do with this. You can make green light into blue light. You can make red light into yellow light. Um, you can keep playing around with the molecules you're using, with the, with the, the concentrations and the, the types of molecules to, to get this process to happen. Um, these are the sorts of molecules we use to do this. So we use like palladium porphyrins and rubrine, which are these two molecules here. Um, I'm no chemist, so I, I couldn't tell you for the life of me how you make them, but if you have really great people you work with, they can do it for you. So that's, that's always nice. There's a, some sort of life lesson there. Um, and just to, to convince you that, that we're not sort of talking magic up here, these processes are really complicated. And everything I'm showing you here is sort of, this is, again, a somewhat simplified description of the process. I'm not going to go through the details of it. Suffice to say that you need one molecule to absorb the exciton, you pass it to another molecule, you need two of those to come into contact with each other, then they pass the exciton between them, throw it up, and then you spit out a photon of a different colour. So there's a lot going on there. You need to understand a lot about different sorts of materials. You need to understand what materials to mix together to make these things happen. Um, the point of this slide is not to, for you to sit there and, and, and absorb the... The, the, the beauty of it, but to, to understand that these are, again, complex and complicated processes that we really need to understand properly if we are to try to make materials that are going to have some industrial application. All right, so what have we got? We've got our spectrum. We've figured out a number of tricky ways to use quantum mechanics to add or take away um, um, photons from each other and get photons of different energy, and we can only do that by knowing that photons are quantized, energy in, of the photon is fixed. We have to conserve energy, that's a quantum mechanical principle, and we have to conserve spin. So we, we're, we're really restricted by what we're allowed to do because of quantum mechanics. So how would we make, go about making a device? This is the sort of device we now envisage. So we have our semiconductor in the middle here. We're allowed to excite electrons. Um, in front of it, we'll put a down converter. Behind it, we'll put an up converter, and the order that we put those is really critical. If I flip them around, I start to do very bad things. If I put my up converter in front of my cell, then it will start to take all the photons before they hit there, and, and, and we'll lose a lot of energy, so the, the details really matter. Um, so yellow photons can come in and excite electrons. Red photons can come in, pass through the cell, excite a, excite a photon, and we get, we get another electron. High energy things can come in, but now instead of generating heat, they produce extra electrons. And now here, what we can do is eventually these electrons would fall back down and nothing would happen. But if we design this thing right, we can put a wire between this side and this side, effectively, and use the energy we've gained in those electrons to do work. And that's what a solar cell is, in, in basically. Um, so if I go back to those pictures, those complicated pictures of how these things actually work, I can start to draw real curves like the ones we've done here today. I can start to draw real curves to show how much efficiency gain I can get using these different processes. And that's what this is. So for silicon, which has an energy, it turns out, of 1.1 energy units, or electron volts is the energy unit we're going to use now, um, we can move from a single cell junction efficiency of about 32% up to a multi-exciton generating system that has an efficiency up around 45%. We can nearly, we can nearly increase by a factor of 50%, the energy efficient, the efficiency that with which um, solar cells should be able to generate energy from the sun. Um, and if the talk stopped there and I said, we've got some for sale out in the, in the back room, off you go, that would be a really lovely place to stop. And hopefully in a few years, that will be where we can stop. 
But I'm an experimentalist. I deal with the realities of being in a lab and trying to make these things work. So I'm going to tell you some of those before we, before we finish up tonight. This is that process. And um, it turns out that the best way to do this is not actually to make these things re-emit the light. The best way to do it is to have a photon come in, get absorbed, turn into, say, these two excitons, and then directly transfer them from the molecule into the silicon solar cell. It turns out that's the most efficient way to harvest that extra energy we've produced. It turns out that's really hard. It's really hard for a whole range of reasons. This is sort of what a silicon, silicon cell looks like. We have uh, the silicon here. It's extraordinarily high quality. Um, the reason we knew a lot about semiconductors for many, many years before we made them was not because we didn't understand them well. It's because the materials we could buy were not good enough. A lot of time was spent during the 1940s and 50s trying to purify and, and, and make as pure as possible the silicon we use so that those electrons we generated could live for a long time and we could extract them. It turns out if there's defects in your semiconductors, then your electron wanders around, finds that defect, and that makes it fall back down very, very quickly. So that's, that's a problem. It turns out defects really like surfaces. The problem is you want big surface areas if you want to make a really good solar cell. I'd like to harvest as much energy from the sun, have a big area. That big area comes with defects. And so we need to do really fancy things to the top of silicon to passivate those defects, to reduce the impact that those defects have on the lifetime of the electrons we generate when we absorb those photons. The problem, they tend to be quite thick, quite, quite inert layers. And if I want to take this molecule that we've made and put a layer of that on top of my silicon solar cell so that those extra excitons can jump across into my silicon solar cell, then that layer needs to start becoming thinner and thinner so those, electron, those excitons can make that transition. Uh, and in doing so, it also has to not get worse. It has to stay as good as it can at passivating. And so the sort of work that's happening around the world now is to try to understand what sort of passivation layer can we use on a silicon solar cell that will still keep the solar cell as efficient as it can be, while at the same time helping to get those excitons from these new materials we're making into the solar cell. So that's one of the sort of the big challenges that we're working towards at the moment. Um, there are other challenges around the molecules themselves. So the molecules we're using tend to be really good at absorbing light, um, which is great, except that if the light they absorb has a too high an energy, then we can destroy the molecules. So it's a really fun balance to try to understand, I want to put a molecule on the surface to help me harvest energy from the sun. At the same time, putting this molecule out in the sun causes it to, deg to degrade. And so we're trying to understand, are there ways that we can make these molecules such that as they degrade, they don't impact the rest of the solar cell. They don't keep shading the solar cell. What you wouldn't want to have happen is have this layer put on top of your solar cell, does a really great job for a week and a half, then it degrades to like a, a, a black piece of plastic and no more light hits your cell. That's not going to be something that anyone will pay for, and in fact, I, I don't know if we'd all be here tonight. Um, the message that Jared and I wanted to tell you tonight was this. Solar cells work because of quantum mechanics. Solar cells work because electrons are, because photons are quantized and they can be absorbed. They're limited in how efficient they can be, again, because of quantum mechanics. The low energy ones don't get absorbed. The high energy ones do, but we can't absorb them effectively. And quantum mechanics can help us circumvent those limits. We can start to build molecular machines or molecular devices that help us modify the spectrum of the sun before it hits our cell to make them more efficient. Um, the reason we do that is to head towards a sustainable energy future. Um, myself and the other chief investigators in my centre really like this picture, the ones from Sydney more so than the ones from Melbourne. Um, and I'm going to be extremely partisan here and say, that's a really great picture. Uh, except that all that light costs us carbon. All that light costs us energy. And having a city that we like to live in is a very different thing from having a city that um, has, has little impact on the environment. What we're trying to do is use our, our knowledge of fundamental science, our knowledge of how to make new molecules, how to make new, new materials, 
to help us live in a world where we can actively and efficiently harvest energy from the sun to allow us to do the sorts of things we can do if we have a lot of energy. More broadly, if you have a lot of energy and that energy is cheap, there are a whole range of societal problems that you can address. You can think about making clean water. You can think about refrigeration and moving drugs around the world for, for, for vaccinations. There are a whole range of problems that are not obviously to do with generating energy that can be solved if you have a very large, very cheap source of power. And that's the sort of thing that motivates us in the work that we do, even though we do like, quite like playing around with our quantum mechanics. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you all very much um, for your time. And I think Paul is going to come up and moderate some questions if anyone would like to ask some. Thank you. Well, it's a, a, a hard ask. I asked them to explain everything in the world about solar cells without using equations. And I think they almost did it, which is great. Um, also, I think what's really a wonderful thing, we live in Australia, which is the sunburnt country. We have more sunlight than anywhere else in the world. And it's not just sunlight, it's full of colour and it's full of science. But it's also our future. And as you can see from this talk today, um, there's a lot to understand about these materials, but there's also a great deal of opportunity. Silicon solar cells in principle could be twice as efficient as they are now. And if we're going to have a future built around solar energy, uh, we're certainly going to want to put out the, the most efficient cells that we can onto our roof. But it's a big challenge, and we certainly need to understand the basic science behind it if we're going to get there. We have 40 years to do it, which sounds like a long time, but it took us 60 years to go from the first silicon solar cell back in the 1950s to where we are now. So it's not really a long time for us to get that extra stage further. Um, I'm sure these guys would love to answer some questions, so I might ask um, Jared as well to come up on the stage, and uh, we're happy to take any questions from the audience that there are. Uh, anyone up there want to ask a professor of physics something, please feel free. Down the front here. A couple of years ago, I read um, the, the cost of producing a kilowatt of electricity using silicon was a given value, and it was approaching the cost of using coal. So I'm wondering, when will the crossover point be, and uh, what impacts is that going to have on, on our economies? Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're there. Um, if you look around the world at large-scale power installations, they tend not to be coal and they tend to be renewable. Um, India has just put out a tender for um, large-scale power generation that was won by a, a, two solar companies. They're producing um, energy at about three or four cents per, um, per, per kilowatt hour. Um, that's cheaper than you can do with coal. So people are not going to build coal-fired power plants anymore. Um, I think. The challenge that we face in Australia is a, is a policy challenge. Um, there's, there's an uncertainty around the federal government's um, energy policy, and as a result, investors are not entirely sure how to, how to cost risk into those, those decisions. And I think that's something that, that um, as, a, as, a, as a set of electors effectively in this room, we can all, all make an impact on, on that. Um, what impact is that going to have on us? Well, it still costs money to make energy. Um, that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, there are going to be costs to making this transition as we move from a, a, a centrally driven coal-fired power plant model to a, either a distributed model or a model that requires more storage. We're going to have to make infrastructure investment to support that. We're going to have to build storage capacity if we want to make, make, make renewables our, our, sort of our primary source of energy. And they, these are the sorts of questions I think you have to grapple with as we make this transition. Another question. This is a question about the, the theory. Um, if instead of using semiconductors and generating electricity that way, if you degrade all of that photon energy to heat and use the heat in the conventional way, what's the theoretical um, yield from that? Um, pretty good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we so were discussing this we, this we, afternoon. We actually had, we talked about an hour about this this afternoon, just yeah. because we thought someone might ask that question. Um, <laughs> heat, it's a really good way to produce hot water. It's a really good way to produce steam. If you want to turn that into energy that we can use as we use energy at the moment, then you need to 
have turbines and power plants that use that energy to, to turn it into, into power, to electricity. Um, there's an infrastructure cost to doing that that, that is, is reasonable. The efficiency is quite good, um, but the, the complexity of doing it is, is higher than, say, a silicon solar cell. Turbines have moving parts. They're harder to make. They're harder to service. The running costs are higher than they are for, for solar. Solar is effectively a, a set-and-forget type technology. You put it out there in a, in a fixed position. Maybe you have a heliostat that follows the sun, um, but, but effectively all you have to do is clean them from time to time, and they stay highly efficient. Um, it's also not clear that anyone's going to put a, a... People will put a, a thermal hot water system on their roof. I'm not sure people will put a thermal hot water system on their roof and then a steam turbine in their backyard. Um, or in their apartment block. Maybe in an apartment block you might. Um, so there, there are, I think, different use cases where either of those technologies might be valuable. And I think, I think it's, there, there's value then in pursuing all of, all of them. I think the Australian uh, Department of Energy, when they're doing their calculations for greenhouse emissions, factor in about 30%. So uh, to produce energy from coal, to produce electricity from coal, it's a maximum efficiency of 30%. So it's a, it's a very, very um, inefficient process with a, a lot more uh, side effects because of the gas production and the health costs to the people who live there than solar energy. And most of the costs of energy do not factor in the remediation required afterwards when the power plants run down. So it's the long-term cost that we haven't generally factored into the system. So I think overall, most renewable energies are, are far better if you actually count cradle-to-grave type of analysis of their impact. Any more questions? Anyone else daring to challenge one of our professors of physics? two energy units into one, what about higher energy, the, the three and the four? Yeah, so they're harder. Um, <laughs> so, harder. so for four, you can think about doing the same thing twice, right? You could think about having a four splitter that goes to two and then a, a two splitter that goes to four ones. Um, maybe we'll get there one day. Um, there are interesting molecules you could think about using. There's these, this, this chemical motif of, of dendromers. They're these molecules that have a central unit and then they branch and have a bunch of other things around them and they branch and have a bunch of other things around them. Um, I'm, I'm making things up now, but maybe you can think about making dendromers that absorb in the centre and then split out along the, out along the dendroma. You have some sort of downhill um, energy, energy potential that did that. Um, I think it's not where we're at at the moment. I think at the moment we're trying to solve the problem of doing two to one and then we're trying to solve the problem of Making a, effectively incorporating that into a, into, a, into a technology that can be mass produced and deployed. Yeah. There was a question over there yeah, somewhere. The back. Um, what drives the size of the gap? What drives the size of the gap? So that's a really so, good question. Do you want yeah. to? Yeah. So that turns out to come from the way the, in this case, silicon atoms interact with each other. So there's a whole bunch of different semiconductors, silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide is very common, and all of these have different gaps. And the gap is a function of how heavy the atom is and how many electrons it has and how those inter electrons interact. But the problem is it's kind of fixed for each different semiconductor. You can mix the semiconductors in, in certain ways so that you can kind of change the gap, but that gap actually never changes more than about half an EV it really sits around this one EV. And the reason is because the, the bonds, the energy required for two electrons to, to bond to make the solid is about an EV. So the whole reason that these molecules have very different gaps is the way they bond together is quite different to the way the standard conventional semiconductors bond together. So this is a bit of a problem. If we could have just semiconductors out of the box that had a range of different band gaps, many of our problems would be solved. It would also solve some problems in computing. But the, the semiconductors we know how to work with only have a gap over a certain range. There's some fairly exotic new ones out there that have these very different gaps. Uh, but then we have the problems of stability. These are typically not as stable as silicon or gallium arsenide or germanium. So this is this kind of a trade-off. And there's a huge area of research, including in the centre, about trying to find new semiconductors and new materials that have different gaps, but are also stable, are also cheap, preferably also don't have really toxic chemicals in them, like, or toxic elements like lead in them. And this is an ongoing area of research. 
If I just add one thing to that, which is if you want to get the most efficient solar cell you can buy, it's not silicon. Um, yeah. If you're going to space, you don't use a silicon cell. You use a, a gallium arsenide cell or some, some more complex cell that's, that's, that's really designed to maximize that sort of efficiency curve at the price of cost. Um, yeah. So if you're sending something to space, you just don't care what it costs. You just want as much power as you can get for weight. So they maximize for weight. Silicon cells maximize for, for, for cost. Oh, there's another one. The so place. just in terms of uh, other renewable sources, how do, where does solar sit in terms of wind and uh, hydro compared to in the efficiency of the, the energy sources? Did you want... So hydro is exceptionally efficient. Um, but you need to drown valleys. This is the fundamental problem. I mean, we saw this in the Franklin Dam and, and places in Tasmania, is you need to build dams. Now, storing water in a dam and then having it flow downhill and turn a, a turbine is actually a very efficient process, but you have to drown valleys. And, so, and in Australia, you have to have the water to put in the valleys. That's, uh, in Australia, that's actually a bigger problem, particularly once you get out of Tasmania for the rest of the country. Um, uh, wind, I think, is getting better. Wind's, wind's competitive. Yeah, I so, think it's competitive so with solar. You, I, I think the best way to, to judge how competitive things are is to look around at what's being built. Um, yeah. People are not going to build things that are not competitive, so people are building solar and wind at the moment. So they're, yeah. they're, they're, that's, I think, for me, one of the better measures of, of how you want to do these things. Yeah. The economics is very much... The renewable sector is very much being driven by the economics. It's, when you asked earlier about the crossover point, the fact that you see solar cells everywhere now is a direct uh, result of us getting to that crossover point. The fact that um, initially the solar cell industry was dominated by Germany because they had the technology, and then at some point China developed the technology and they could do everything cheaper. And overnight, it just destroyed the German industry, and now huge amounts of solar cell production is done in China. And it's just that economics just driving what is out there. That is true, but if you look at the... The, the problem is that China, you multiply any number by that population. They are also investing huge amounts in renewable, much more than we are, because it's the numbers. They just have such a huge population. So, yeah, for them, at the moment, cheap coal, they know how the technology works, they're rolling it out as fast as possible, they're also building nuclear reactors, they're also installing wind turbines, they're also doing solar, they're doing everything at once. And it's just a matter of what eventually wins out. Yep. What's the feasibility of using other wavelengths in the el um, electromagnetic spectrum as a source of energy? Ah, that, 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 that's a really good question. Um, that plot that Dane showed that black body curve with the gaps in it, the problem is that's the energy coming from the sun. In principle, so for instance, um, converting gamma rays or x-rays into energy is actually relatively easy. I mean, you still have to do some complicated stuff, but we just don't have enough of them. The, the sheer amount of power that's coming from the sun compared to all the other wavelengths, it it's just sits in a nice part of, of um, parameter space where you, can, where you can use that energy. Um, the sun produces a lot of heat, a lot of far infrared energy as well, but it follows that curve. So the further you go this way, the less energy you get. The further you go that way, the less energy you get. So it's just trying to optimise for what we get from the sun. But for instance, you can think about... Um, we, we can do geothermal energy. There's energy coming out of the centre of the Earth. And we do turn that... New Zealand, Iceland, turn that into steam, turn that into electricity. It doesn't have to be just visible. It's just that that's most of the light landing on the planet is in that range. Time for perhaps one more question, maybe down. Oh, one sec. One sec, wait for the microphone. Oh. Yeah. So the material that you have produced, how scalable is it? And do we have any alternatives and like what things we should start with to, to make new materials like that? Um, so my view is that almost anything is scalable eventually in the chemical space. Paul might have a different view than I, but... Um, <laughs> um, 
I, I think the big challenge is the fact that we have to combine a whole lot of requirements. The, the biggest requirements is a material that's very efficient, that's also getting the cost down, and it also has to be non-toxic, and ultimately has to be recyclable. And when you try and put all those things together, there are really only a couple of materials out there at the moment which look to be possible. Um, and the, the goal of our centre, in fact, is to try and expand the range of materials that we can find. So I, I think that at the moment there's no clear winner. Um, what the guys showed you here tonight was a couple of the materials that we're trying to work with, which are showing us the concept that we can improve silicon solar cells. I don't think we've actually found the one yet, which I would go out there tomorrow and put onto my roof. But uh, that's what our, our goal is, is that we eventually will have new materials that will go on top of solar cells, existing or new ones, which will push that us right past that 30% efficiency. But uh, we have to discover the right materials, which uh, that's, that's the challenge. Right, I might um, call the proceedings to a halt there before these guys' voices drop out, but um, uh, we always like to acknowledge um, great talks uh, with great um, prizes and awards, and uh, we have a pair of socks for each of you here. All right, um, I think that uh, in two weeks' time we're going to try and um, continue this conversation. Have I got that up there? Uh, at the Royal Society of Victoria, Wallace Wong is going to talk about organic solar cells and flexible solar cells and how they hope to transform the way we use solar cells. So hopefully some of you will make it along to there. Um, for the rest of you, if you want to ask more questions or have a conversation about energy in our future, uh, please join us for drinks and nibbles out the back now. But uh, thank you once again to Jared and Dane.